I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Today, I'm finally going to talk about Aphrodite. She's the goddess of desire, sex, and love, of seduction and sweetness. She causes desire in others and takes a great joy in using this power. She is often called laughter-loving. But if Aphrodite can give people desire, then she can take it away, too. At Thebes, she was worshipped as Aphrodite Apotrophia, the Expeller. She removed desire from men after sinful pleasure. As you will soon hear, the myths paint her as beautiful and sexy. She dances with other goddesses and causes them to fall in love with each other, and this is the main cause of her power. But the Greek Aphrodite also has a physical strength to her, too. She was called Aphrodite Aria, the warlike, when dressed in armor, and was also called Aphrodite Nikephorus, bringer of victory in some of her cults. Aphrodite has shown up in a few of the episodes so far, one of which was way back in the creation episodes, talking about the weird circumstances of her birth in Hesiod's Theogony. The story goes back all the way to the time of the Titans, when the youngest of the original twelve Titans, Kronos, decided it was time to kill his father Aranos. As I talked about back then, Kronos cut off the penis and testicles of Aranos with a sharp sickle. He then threw them away and they sailed through the air before finally falling in the ocean, dripping blood as they went. After landing in the sea, a white foam formed around the genitals as they floated around the island of Kathira, and from there went out to sea. Within the foam, a woman grew, and when this mass of foam finally floated all the way to Cyprus, the woman, a goddess, was born. This was Aphrodite, and she was the goddess of love and sex. She was responsible for the whispering of girls, smiles and deceits with sweet delight, and love and graciousness, as Hesiod puts it so nicely. So, I guess you could say Uranus was the father of Aphrodite. The name Aphrodite reflects this myth too. Hesiod gives its meaning as sea foam, as in born from the sea foam. Other ancient Greek scholars agreed with that meaning, but scholars today are a little more unsure. Regardless, though, the myth of Aphrodite being born from the sea is the dominant tradition in Greek myth. The sixth Homeric hymn, which is dedicated to Aphrodite and is from a similar period as Hesiod's Theogony, also tells the story. It doesn't explicitly mention Aranos, but it does talk about how Aphrodite floated over the waves within sea foam until she finally emerged at Cyprus. She was welcomed by the Horae, three goddesses who marked the passing of time. Since she had just been born, Aphrodite was naked, and they dressed her in fine clothes, gave her a crown, pierced her ears, and gave her beautiful necklaces and jewels, and then finally took her to their father's house, to Zeus's house, to dance with the other immortals. Later sources keep this same story, but of course there are also other myths that tell a different version. The Iliad and the Odyssey, which are again roughly from the same period as the Theogony and the Homeric hymns, though slightly older, are the best examples of this different version. They say that Aphrodite was not the daughter of Aranos. Instead, Aphrodite is the daughter of Zeus and one of the female titans, named Dione. But who, anyway, is Dione? Well, she also appears in Hesiod's Theogony as one of the many daughters of Oceanus and Tethys, our marine ocean titans. Later sources, though, give her a different parentage. Sometimes she is even said to be one of the original twelve titans. I've heard that Dione may actually be another name for the titan Phoebe, which could also explain that, but really, who knows? Even though we don't really know who she is, Dione pops up in a few Greek myths. She is one of the goddesses who was present when Leto gave birth to Apollo on the island of Delos. But her major appearance is in the Iliad, and sure enough, it shows her acting as a mother to Aphrodite. You see, at one point in the Trojan War, several gods joined the fighting. Aphrodite ended up being stabbed by the Greek hero Diomedes and fled to Olympus, and there she is comforted by her mother Dione, who holds Aphrodite close, gives her a hug, and asks her who stabbed her. Dione tells Aphrodite that there were other mortals who once harmed one of the gods, but that in all those cases, the man who fights an immortal does not live long. So she comforts Aphrodite, and then she strokes her arm and made it as good as new. So here we have an actual scene backing up the Aphrodite as the daughter of Zeus and Dione myth tradition, and not just a one-off line like in some of the Homeric hymns. What's interesting is the classical Greeks actually recognized that there were different origins for Aphrodite given in the earlier myths. Some 
even tried to make sense of it. The philosopher Plato, in his work The Symposium, written around 385 BC, shows a theory that there were actually two Aphrodites. Aphrodite Orania, who was the motherless daughter of Oranos, and a younger Aphrodite Pandemos, who was the daughter of Zeus and Dione. It's a thought-provoking theory, to say the least. And it's actually referenced in another philosopher's work, Xenophon's Symposium. But he doubts the theory, saying that they could be two names for the same goddess. To Xenophon, not knowing the real parents of Aphrodite is not something to worry about. Whichever way Aphrodite was born, though, she ended up living with the other gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus. I already mentioned that she spends time there dancing with some of the other younger goddesses. These daughters of Zeus actually make up Aphrodite's entourage. They are the three Charities, or Graces, and the three Horae. Sometimes Aphrodite is accompanied by Hebe, the goddess of youth, too. In art, she is usually shown accompanied by two winged male youths. These are Eros and Himeros, both gods of love. Eros is actually the Greek version of the Roman Cupid, making him one of the few Greek gods that still shows his face today, on Valentine's Day. Eros and Himeros were actually sons of Aphrodite, with Ares being their father. In the Iliad, Aphrodite is unmarried, but clearly some kind of partner to Ares. In the Odyssey, we get the myth of Aphrodite's marriage to Hephaestus and affair with Ares, which I've already talked about in those gods' specific episodes. But regardless of the circumstances of Aphrodite and Ares' relationship, they were the parents of several immortals, and some of their kids accompanied Aphrodite, and others spent their time hanging out with their father. Besides Ares, Aphrodite is said to have had children with other gods as well. Diodorus of Sicily, writing in the 1st century BC, is the oldest available source that says Hermes had a child with Aphrodite, and that this boy's name was Hermaphroditos. A Roman mythographer, writing around 200 years later, gives a story where Hermes lusts after Aphrodite, and his father Zeus decided to intervene, and while Aphrodite was bathing in a river, he sends an eagle to steal her sandal and take it to Hermes. When Aphrodite goes to look for the sandal, she finds Hermes with it, who then bribes Aphrodite for sex. It's a weird story from the tail end of the Roman period. In poems and myths, Aphrodite is often described as Golden Aphrodite because of her great beauty. Besides being an object of desire herself, Aphrodite, as the goddess of love and sex, has the power to create passions in the hearts and minds of both immortals and humans, and also animals too. There are three goddesses, though, that she does not have power over. They are Athena, Artemis, and Hestia, one of Zeus's sisters. All three of these goddesses are the virgin goddesses in Greek mythology. Everyone else, though, is fair game for Aphrodite, even the king of the gods Zeus himself. In fact, in the ancient Greek literature, whenever there are two people together, this is usually said to be the will of Aphrodite. She is variously described as spying, peeping, and whispering as she works her matchmaking magic. One of the Homeric hymns almost seems to lay blame for Zeus's affairs on Aphrodite. It says that Zeus's heart is led astray by her, and that Aphrodite beguiles his heart whenever she pleases and causes him to mate with mortal women, something which does tend to get Zeus into trouble. But Zeus also shares some of this power and decided to use his own powers to make Aphrodite desire to sleep with a mortal man. To the immortals, having sex with mortals, with humans, seems to be looked down upon, especially when done by goddesses, and making Aphrodite also desire a mortal seems to have been intended to prevent her from ever mocking the other Olympians for sleeping with humans again. Zeus made it so that as soon as she saw him, Aphrodite desired a handsome man named Anchises, who was herding cattle on Mount Ida near the city of Troy. After seeing Anchises, Aphrodite then went to her temple on Cyprus. She had the graces bathe her and massage her body with sweet, fragrant oils. She put on her fancy clothes and her gold brooches, earrings, and necklaces, and then went to find Anchises. She went across the mountains and was followed by all sorts of wild animals, wolves, lions, bears, leopards, and also deer. She found Anchises all alone, he saw her, and let's just say he was blown away. He asked her if she was a goddess, or one of the graces, or another immortal. He said if she was, he would build an altar to her and offer sacrifice. 
and Chizis asked her if she felt kindly for him. He then asked her if she would make him an important person among his fellow Trojans, and give him strong children, and let him live a long and happy life. And Chizis seems to have already really thought about what he would ask a goddess if he ever saw one. Aphrodite, though, decides to lie. She tells him she is not an immortal. She tells him her father was Atreus, the king of Phrygia, a region nearby, and that she knows the language of Troy because one of the nurses who raised her spoke it. Aphrodite tells him that she was dancing together with other young women, nymphs, and even the goddess Artemis, when Hermes suddenly showed up, kidnapped her, and carried her away to Mount Ida. She told Anchises that Hermes told her she would be Anchises' wife, and at the end of her story, Aphrodite used her powers to make Anchises desire her back. Well, he did, and he said he couldn't wait for marriage and wanted to sleep with her right away. So Anchises took her by the hand and led Aphrodite to a soft couch, which apparently just so happened to be conveniently nearby, and, as the hymn puts it, by the will of the gods and destiny he lay with her, a mortal man with an immortal goddess, not clearly knowing what he did. But he was about to find out, because afterwards Aphrodite made him fall fast asleep. Then she dressed, stood up, and then woke him up, saying, Get up! Why do you sleep so heavily? Consider whether I look as I did when first you saw me with your eyes. And Chizis awoke and became afraid. He said he knew she was a goddess as soon as he saw her, but that she did not tell him the truth. He asks her to take pity on him. But Aphrodite tells him not to worry. She tells him that she will give him a son who will be a ruler among the Trojans, and that this boy's name will be Aeneas, which means terrible grief, because that was how Aphrodite felt when she realized she slept with a human. Sounds kind of harsh. But there are two reasons why Aphrodite might feel this way. One, that Anchises, who she loves, is a mortal who is doomed to age and die, and will leave her alone after he perishes. And two, she is embarrassed because she had sex with a mortal, and that's just not what good goddesses do. Aphrodite tells him the baby will be raised by nymphs in the mountains, and when he is a young boy, they will bring the baby to Anchises to look after and take to Troy. She tells Anchises that if anyone ever asks, he is not to say Aphrodite was the mother, but instead say it was one of the nymphs in the woods. If he does not do that, and let slip that Aphrodite is the boy's mother, Zeus will zap him with a thunderbolt. And with that done, and her instructions given, Aphrodite left Anchises. Because of her embarrassment, she stopped making the other immortals fall in love with human beings. But Aphrodite's embarrassment doesn't seem to have lasted long as other myths have Aphrodite have other children with human men. Apollodorus's library actually says that Aphrodite had not one, but two sons with Anchises. Their second child was named Leros. Now, with Anchises, Aphrodite told a lie and cast a spell to get him to sleep with her. In other cases, though, she did what some of the other gods do, kidnap their lovers. In Hesiod's Theogony, we are told about a man named Phaeton. This Phaeton was the son of Cephalos, who was a lover of the dawn goddess Eos, and was actually kidnapped by the dawn goddess. His son Phaeton seems to have had the same destiny as his father, because Aphrodite swooped down, picked him up, and took him to her temple. Apollodorus tells us that their son was named Astinus. Another example is a man named Butes, or Butes. He was an Argonaut, the name given to a bunch of Greek heroes who went on a sailing expedition and have a number of adventures. At one point, the Argonauts sail past the Rock of the Sirens, strange, bird-like female monsters who use singing and music to trick passing sailors into crashing their ships or drowning themselves. Butes is one of their victims. He jumps off the ship and swims towards the Sirens' island. Before he drowns, Aphrodite whisks him away to Sicily to become her lover, and a king named Eryx is said to be their son. Now, this story is kind of weird, though, since in other versions, Butes is the son of Aeneas, making him Aphrodite's grandson. So add grandmother grandson incest to the long list of incests we've heard about so far in Greek mythology. Anchises, Phaeton, and Butes are all examples of Aphrodite's sexual success with mortals. Aphrodite, though, does not always get her way with mortals. One of her most important myths, her romance with a mortal named Adonis, shows this really well. Our earliest reference to their relationship is in the poems of a female Greek poet named Sappho, who lived around 630 to 570 BC. So, pretty old. This is archaic Greece stuff. 
Unfortunately, Sappho doesn't have much to say to us today, just a small piece of a poem that mentions girls asking Aphrodite about Adonis's death. Nothing else, though. The rest of this particular poem is lost to history. To get the longer story, we have to look to the Roman and later Greek poets writing 600 years later. The story starts with a human princess named Mira. She offended Aphrodite, who caused her to sleep with her own father, and Mira eventually got pregnant. After that, though, Aphrodite had a change of heart and turned Mira into a tree before she could give birth. So instead, the young boy, named Adonis, grew inside the tree. Eventually, its bark split open and the baby tumbled out. According to Ovid, he was raised by the local nymphs, and later, one of Eros's magic love arrows cut Aphrodite and she was overcome with desire for the beautiful youth. But whatever the reason is, she wanted him. In other versions, like in Apollodorus's library, Adonis was taken by Aphrodite to the underworld in a box and given to Persephone to raise. But when Persephone finally saw Adonis, she fell in love with him and refused to return the grown mortal to Aphrodite. Eventually, Aphrodite and Persephone took their dispute to Zeus, who decided that Adonis would spend a third of the year with Persephone, a third with Aphrodite, and he could pick one of them for another third. Adonis loved Aphrodite back, and he chose to spend the additional time with her. Seems like an okay happy ending for Adonis and Aphrodite then, right? So how then did Adonis die? Well, Adonis was a hunter. Aphrodite warned him to stay clear of wolves and boars and bears, but one day, when Aphrodite was away, Adonis couldn't resist. His hounds came across the scent of a boar in the woods, and he went hunting for it. But wild boar are actually very dangerous to hunt. Adonis succeeded in spearing the boar, but it was still able to run him through with its sharp tusks, and Adonis fell to the ground, bleeding. Aphrodite heard his dying groans and rushed back to be with him, but when she found him, he was already dead. A tragic myth, then, showing another dispute between different goddesses, too. But Adonis' death may have been a part of the dispute, too. Some versions say that the boar was not just your average boar, but was actually the war god Ares in disguise. Ares, the lover of Aphrodite, was jealous of Adonis and wanted him out of the way. And other versions say the boar was sent by Persephone, which makes sense with the rest of the myth. With Adonis dead, he spends all of his time in the underworld with Persephone, and not just a third of every year. In this version, Adonis' death comes at the end of an ugly child custody battle. And then, of course, there is another famous contest involving Aphrodite and some other goddesses. This one is called the Judgment of Paris, and it fits in with the stories of the Trojan War. It all starts when Aphrodite, Hera, and Athena argue over which of them could be considered the fairest. Like with a lot of these divine contests, Zeus was asked to be the judge. But Zeus didn't want to get involved with this one knowing he would inevitably make two goddesses angry with his selection. Instead, Zeus had Hermes take the three goddesses to Mount Ida near Troy and ask a human named Paris to decide. This is often imagined and depicted in art as basically a beauty contest between three goddesses. Later, Renaissance painters really loved painting the three goddesses naked and strutting their stuff in front of Paris. But remember this, two of the goddesses, Hera, the wife of Zeus, and Athena, one of the virgin goddesses, are not the type to stand naked in front of anyone, much less some strange human sitting on a mountainside. No, the most important part of this myth is that the three goddesses offered Paris a choice, a choice of three gifts. Sometimes they're described as bribes. Hera promised to make Paris a king of Europe and Asia, which to the ancient Greeks would basically mean the whole world. Athena offered to make Paris a wise warrior, skilled in battle, and capable of winning lots of glory. And finally, Aphrodite said she would give Paris the most beautiful woman in the world. So, beauty contest or not, the contest hinges on whichever gift is the most attractive to Paris. And Paris ends up choosing the world's most beautiful woman, and naming Aphrodite as the fairest. But there was a catch. As it happened, the world's most beautiful woman was already married and Paris ended up having to kidnap her with Aphrodite's help. Hera and Athena were furious that they had not been picked, and the fallout of having an angry husband and two goddesses against him meant Paris triggered the Trojan War. But that's a story for another day. Today, so far, we've got some myths showing tensions between Aphrodite and the other Olympians, trickery with Zeus, cheating on Hephaestus, and an argument with Persephone. 
But Aphrodite also had camaraderie with the other deities too, and used her powers to help them as well. Aphrodite possessed a magic girdle, or cestus, a piece of embroidered clothing that covered her chest. It was magic because it contained some of that power to inspire passion in others that Aphrodite possessed herself. And sometimes, Aphrodite would lend out this cestus. In one case in the Iliad, Hera goes to Aphrodite to borrow the cestus to use it to reunite the quarreling titan couple Oceanus and Tethys. Aphrodite agreed, and gave it to Hera, seemingly unaware of Hera's real purpose, which was to use it to seduce Zeus, and then, when he wasn't paying attention, allow the gods to cause problems on Earth. What about how Aphrodite was worshipped by the Greeks? Aphrodite's most important temples were located on the islands of Cyprus and Kythera. This shouldn't come as a surprise. These are the two places mentioned in the myth of her birth from sea foam. The story of Aphrodite's seduction of Anchises took place on Mount Ida in what is now northwestern Turkey. Sure enough, this was also an important site for Aphrodite worship. But Aphrodite was also worshipped all across Greece, in private prayers and rituals, from Athens to Sparta, and all the way to Sicily. Sacrifices made to honor Aphrodite included incense and flowers, but also animals such as pigs, goats, rabbits, and other animals associated with sex and fertility. But in the city of Corinth, women offered their bodies to Aphrodite too. Not literally, of course. They did not sacrifice their own lives. Instead, in Corinth, there were women who acted as sacred prostitutes in Aphrodite's temple there. Not typical street prostitutes, though, who I should mention Aphrodite was also a patron of. These prostitute priestesses of Aphrodite were different. They were called heteri, and they were usually upper-class women and highly educated in the arts. The heteri also worked as entertainers. They danced, played instruments, and wrote poems dedicated to Aphrodite. I've talked a little about Aphrodite's names and epithets in this episode. Just like I have in other episodes, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Mycenaean Greeks. The name Aphrodite, or anything similar to it, does not appear in any examples we have of Mycenaean writing, unlike most of the other Greek gods. This doesn't necessarily mean that there was no Aphrodite. Maybe they just used a completely different name. But many scholars do believe the goddess the classical Greeks called Aphrodite was heavily influenced by somewhere else, specifically by several similar goddesses from the Middle East. Some of the ancient Greeks seem to have maybe thought this too. The Greek geographer Pausanias claimed that the first peoples to have cults honoring Aphrodite were the Assyrians and the Phoenicians. These are people who lived in what is now northern Iraq and on the coasts of Lebanon. Sure enough, in the late Greek Dark Ages, before 800 BC, there would have been contacts between these three lands. Maybe the Greeks borrowed Aphrodite. Maybe they merged their Mycenaean love goddess with an older one from the Middle East. And that's all for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please get the word out and tell your friends. As always, thank you for listening.